might not be oh so far away. Maybe we should talk about some of these earnings then that are pulling things higher and causing me to worry a bit. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's start in Europe because we never do. Uh, you've been looking at, well, LVMH, uh, which is um, where we left things off before. Uh, what's been happening there, Steve? Uh, so, uh, pretty decent report, to be honest with you. Uh, this was uh, the sort of report, Steve, that puts you back to being the world's richest person. And uh, that's what happened to uh, um, Chairman and CEO, I believe he is, um, Bernard Arnault. Uh, topped back on top of uh, on top of Moscow, obviously wasn't helped by his own company's performance. So, LVMH at one point was up about sixteen percent today, and it fell back to about twelve point eight percent on the day, which for a company of its size is a really really big jump. It took others with it as well. Uh, we'll try and explore where, uh, why that was. Uh, Kering was one that jumped uh, quite a big amount. That's a that's a competitor of sorts, and uh, Richmond um, from Switzerland that jumped as well. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, Bernard's a very interesting fella. Uh, there's a couple of interesting uh, attacks on his competitors in his call, um, but yeah, uh, it was good. I enjoyed it. I, uh, to, and to say uh, for such a big company, the presentation that they put out is really really interesting. However, I got to the end of the presentation and, and realized that I'd not really written anything down. Um, there was a lot of fluff in it, uh, but it is an interesting presentation. And if it's a company you're interested in, I would recommend reading it all the same, even if they're really just telling you sort of stuff you already know. Um, so, yeah, this was uh, end of the year for them as well. So it's full year uh, results. Um, revenue was up 9% year on year. It grew to 86.2 billion euros. Uh, this was actually affected by a four percent currency headwind, as I found in the uh, in the presentation. So uh, it's actually more like thirteen percent growth organically, which organically is always a, an interesting word to me as well, because they acquire a company and then a the year later they call it organic growth. Um, it's not quite what that is, but um, anyway, breaking it down into segments. So there's wine and spirits. Um, this includes your champagnes and your Hennessy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was actually down 7% to 6.6 billion euros. Uh, fashion and leather goods, which is by far the biggest sector, that was up 9% to 42.2 billion euros. Perfume and cosmetics was up 7% to 8.3 billion euros. Uh, watches and jewelry was up 3% to 10.9 billion euros. And selective retailers was plus 20% to 17.9 billion euros. So, Fairly decent growth uh, across the board. Uh, Wines and Spirits was a particular laggard of the lot, but it is uh, the smallest um, sector. Uh, that equated to $22.8 billion uh, in profit. That's up 8%, uh, a 26.5% operating margin. That's actually down 0.1% uh, year on year. And uh, about $8.1 billion in operating free cash flow. So uh, quite a healthy uh, financial performance. Uh, in terms of geographies, um, it was 25% US, which experienced 4% revenue growth, 25% EU, which was 13% revenue growth, 31% Asia, 18% growth, 12% other markets, 7% uh, Japan, 28% growth. Uh, they also announced an increase in the dividend, Steve. I know you'll be excited about that. Um, they've uh, taken it from 12 euros up to 13 euros, uh, and they were keen to stress that this is actually a 17% uh, annual growth rate. Uh, over the last five years so i took a look at the call the call was pretty interesting uh there's bits and pieces on there um i'm just going to pull off uh, a few bits and pieces and uh, and see what you think um so bernard was up first and he said firstly i need to tell you that the end of the year was rather good the fourth quarter uh, delivered higher growth than the third and that's good news we know that there were some uncertainties in the market but it went well and yet, in 2023, the economic and especially geopolitical context was rather, was rather uncertain with the conflicts around the world, inflation, rising interest rates. I think it all seems to be calming a bit. We'll see what the situation is in 2024, uh, but it, this was a year marked by those global difficulties. Uh, he said um, he was talking about watches and jewellery and, uh, and various brands and mentioned that um, Sauvage is the number one uh, for the second uh, or third consecutive uh, most widely sold uh, fragrance, both in the men's category and actually across all categories. Uh, it's a fragrance that they actually launched over 10 years ago, um, so it's very good performance that you know it's, it's still doing so well. Um, 
In selective retailing, he hired the he, he highlighted the remarkable performance of Sephora, uh, which is a, a makeup brand that they acquired fairly recently. Uh, this has managed to exceed all of their forecasts, and in the soft luxury segment, uh, they have two strong the two strongest brands in the world with uh, Louis Vuitton and Dior. And they have uh, good competitors without mentioning um, the remarkable Chanel and Hermes. In hard luxury category, that's things like watches and jewellery. Um, they have outstanding brands such as Tiffany and Bulgari. And in uh, in the competition, there's a very good group in the Richmond group, um, which has Cartier and Van Cleef and things like that. So uh, quite a bit of competition, uh, but, but doing really, really well. Um, he had a chat about the decentralized structure about LVMH, which is something that uh, they talked quite a bit about in the Business Breakdowns podcast. So we, we would encourage you to go over to, uh, and listen to that if you're interested. But essentially, there's about 70 companies within LVMH who they all have their sort of own CEO. Uh, they have some autonomy. Bernard calls it full autonomy, but it's quite well known that he will get on the blower to them and give them an absolute bollocking if something's not quite going the, the way he wants to go. Um, so he, he explained this as, he called it interaction. He said, there's interaction, but there's independence. Uh, every leader behaves as though he owns the brand, and that's good. Sometimes it's difficult because we want to intervene and step in, and sometimes we don't agree, but that's good, and that's how it should be. Um, about the short and medium term, he said, um, when he joined LVMH, uh, sorry, when you joined LVMH, I said, you're joining a family, not just an anonymous group. Um, you will see the family members and two additional family members that will be joining the board. And I think this is good, aside from the fact that it brings down the average age of our executives. Um, they asked him if he uh, was planning to um, leave in the near future, and he said that he hadn't planned to. Uh, he doesn't plan to leave in the short or medium term. So rest assured, and that might make you sad, but I'm uh, I'm here for a while yet. Um, talking about Louis Vuitton, he said that it was a very special business. It's the leading global luxury brand. Um, it's not just about fashion. Um, they've invested quite a bit of it. Um, it's uh, they're, they're working on historical products uh, that they're developing with um, uh, Pietro, which is the new um, CEO. Uh, the designers and others are truly uh, the call for this French historical brand, he said. Uh, they're making many workshops uh, in France, uh, giving a lot of work where we recruit lots of great craftsmen every year uh, is driving this brand to success. Uh, they asked him a little bit more about succession planning, and he said... Um, Essentially, that he's not looking to uh, step down in the in the in the near term future. He mentioned that uh, they've basically con uh, consolidated the the hold of his controlling family. Uh, they've nominated his two sons to the board: uh, Alexandra, uh, who's thirty one, and Frederick, who's twenty nine. Uh, they're both candidates that still need to be voted in, but they they are nominated. I think they're going to be uh, voted on or that topic is going to be voted on in April. Uh, that will mean four of his five children are on the board. Um, only the 25-year-old uh, Jean does not have a seat, although I would imagine that is coming in the near future. Uh, these are not the typical sort of nepotism sort of issues that you would uh, think these are going to be. These these kids have worked in the company uh, pretty much since they've been able to. And um, uh, Bernard has sort of drilled into them a sense of... Uh, exactly what they need to do to make this this company a, a success uh, he is an engineer by trade uh, not uh, not a um a luxury goods man at all so he's got he's got a business brain on his shoulders and he's been he's been working hard to instill that in his uh, in his kids so i think this is a pretty interesting stock steve i like i say i'm now an owner in this stock an owner of this stock and um yeah, I thought I think it's it came through with a lot of positivity, and um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's sparked a little bit of interest back in the luxury sector again. Yeah, those are interesting numbers. Those are good numbers, and it's always interesting to try and work out which of two things the good numbers tell you, and it could be both. Um, I suppose it could be neither as well, but it could be both. Um, one is this sector is holding better than people think, or there's still strong demand in this sector, um, possibly. The other is this company has uh, some, in some way unique or better than average or specifically good brands. And even if uh, the sector itself is under pressure, and we've been seeing bits of this sector come under pressure. I mean, it's a bit hard, I think, to work out where you draw the line between 
um, luxury goods and non-luxury goods. There are other words that get kind of chucked around, right? Like premium uh, and so on. And I'm not quite sure what I think the difference between luxury and premium is. So if you think about um, uh, LVMH's kind of wines and spirits arm, as they call it here, that features things like Moe, things like Krug, things like uh, Glenmorangie, which is whiskey, and compare that with something like um, Diageo, which considers itself to be premium, uh, I guess, in its way. And I think they own things like Johnny Walker, uh, Tanqueray, and Lagavulin. Um, and some of those, where it comes down to Glenmorangie against Lagavulin, I, I wonder whether the premium one is the other way. But um, I'm interested in, I think what this might be showing you is that there's some real strength in brands over uh, LVMH, because bits of this sector, the kind of less exclusive premium uh, or something like that uh, part of the market appears to be falling away a little bit. You've seen Burberry struggle. Now, admittedly, that has as much to do with China as anything. Uh, you've seen other companies come under pressure as well when they're, maybe their kind of luxury credentials don't quite square up with uh, the exclusivity that people who are really, really uh, spending the money on these things want and demand. So I was impressed by this. You mentioned there have been a bit of a pull higher across other areas of these things, but it feels to me like at least some of this is uh, backing LVMH specifically and maybe specifically some of the brands and companies it owns as part of its conglomerate rather than just turns out that the uh, luxury consumer goods um, market is is stronger than we thought it was. I have one other thought on that for you uh, in a bit, but do you get the same impression? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely the same impression. I think, um, I mean, generally the market was was really down on this area and it's right to be because every time we've had inflationary periods, luxury goods have suffered, um, uh, you know, and with it, obviously with the uh, interest rates that come with it. So um, you would have been quite within your sort of... Um, you know, you would probably quite correct in your thoughts if your history was going to repeat yourself here and LVMH were going to struggle. Uh, and that's um, that's definitely not what happened. Um, this is a company that does um, growth by acquisition, essentially. I mean, it's pretty good once it gets the brands in at 10 in the screw and growing these brands even further. But uh, the way it looks for its major growth is through... Um, is for acquisition and, and there are interesting tidbits in uh the statement uh about um uh richmond which they had a um a, a, an offer to buy them turn down um last year um he said uh essentially that he considers rupert to be an outstanding leader and he doesn't in the slightest wish to upset his strategy and understands that he wants to remain independent uh, and he finds that good but if he wants help to maintain his independence i'll be there he says so uh, i think that's a a big hint at where he was uh, you know where he's looking for the next leg uh, of of growth um is is going to come from um he did say uh, in a sort of um cuz he's quite aggressive in the way that he talks and i was talking to steve about this off air he's not afraid to say like ceos are usually quite diplomatic they usually say like you know other people do discounts that's not our strategy uh He's a little bit more direct than that. So he says he was asked essentially if they'd done any discounting in the wine and spirits to try and make up the sales. And he says, uh, but what you said about discount, there were no discounts. We cancelled the price increases, but we offered no discounts. Discounts is what Perno and Remy do. <laughs> so they're disparaging the uh, disparaging the neighbours. But um, I'll just quickly finish with this, Steve. This was quite a good bit that he pulled out of the, uh, the thing. It was about... Um, uh, Sephora, uh, Sephora, sorry, because he said that it was difficult and it's a bit different because it's retailing. Um, but the success that they've achieved uh, in the last year was quite extraordinary. It was growing at about 20%, uh, which they think is, is quite far and above um, what they were expecting. So they said that they were not experiencing the same at Tiffany. Uh, they think it's going well there and they're not in a hurry uh, since they acquired it, um, I think, in 2021. But um, yeah, they were saying that growth at Tiffany is not as strong as expected, but um, its operating income has actually tripled since they bought it. So this is something where they've managed to, rather than grow it on the top line, they've managed to screw down the costs and 
uh, and get it to grow. But they've also said they're not going to triple it in the next two years. So you have to sort of like bear that in mind that you know they've had some pretty outstanding success, uh, but they don't think that is uh, that is to be repeated. So they're expecting eight to ten percent growth from here, Steve. That's the the uh, the sort of number that um, Bernard wants to put on it. He thinks that essentially it's your problem as shareholders for pricing in 25% growth in a company that realistically is pretty big and finds that really hard to, you know, to, he's going to find it really hard to grow that. He said, you know, his words where they've reached a stage where they no longer need to have high growth and between 8 and 10% is like perfect and sustainable for them. And I can see what he's saying, Nessie. This is a really big company, and and obviously ten percent growth uh, is uh, is really good for LVMH here. So I think it's a fascinating business, Steve. It's got a lot of moving parts, but it's not difficult to understand. I think if you if you can get a grasp on the sector itself. Um, you said um, last week, Steve. I think it was pretty much along the lines of people need clothes, but they don't always need those clothes. I think some people do need these clothes, and I think some people's lives depend on having them. What do you think about that? I'm not... Maybe. Um, I think the number of people to whom that applies... I'm not going to say it's not true of anybody, um, but I think the number of people to whom that applies is small. I was just looking at some of their uh, brands that they um, have here, and while I recognize all of them as luxury, I was writing down price points for some of their higher end products here. And I'm looking at uh, Moe at sort of between 20 and 45 quid a bottle. Um, Tiffany engagement rings at around 1500 quid. Uh, and Tag Heuer uh, watches, I was trying to work out as expensive as I could go. You can probably go a lot higher on the Louis Vuitton stuff, actually, but two to 6,000. Um, and each of those price points is a price that I would not pay uh particularly easily but it's also a price that i could see myself working myself to be in a position to afford um i'm not going to pay it because i choose not to but could i save six grand and buy a watch say like a really good one a tag Heuer one um yep probably if i really put my mind to it i could i could save six grand for something um if i figured out my kind of weekly monthly budget better could i find a spare 45 quid and spend it on champagne yep i'm not going to uh have other uses for it but there's a certain sense, I think, to this, which says that they're they're clearly expensive. They're clearly exclusive in that regard. But they set you aside as the kind of person who has this stuff to spend on things that people don't need in ways that even ways that like Ferrari or something uh, doesn't to an extent. Um, Ferrari is like beyond the level of no, I don't, to be honest, know how I could get myself into a position to afford a uh, Ferrari. I mean, maybe if I sold a house or something, but. Uh, or inheritance or whatever whatever but um i don't see my way to affordability with those things and i think there's something kind of aspirational then about the lvmh stuff where when i think about luxury stuff and the luxury things that i or quote unquote luxury things that i own they were nearly all given to me and they were nearly all given to me because i asked for them and i asked for them because i kind of deep down want to be the kind of person that has enough disposable income to to live that life i don't actually want to do it but i want to be the kind of person that can do it and use whatever fancy shower gel shaving stuff um whatever whatever it might be in this um instance so i think there's something about these kind of brands where i mean if you think if you're right that there is a kind of category of person that these things matter to that or or need uh, if we go as far as to say that for the moment the pricing on this stuff isn't a case of well, I don't care how much you need a Ferrari, you can't buy one. Um, and also, they have a, a kind of largest dis- distribution retail scale, which makes buying it a lot easier than buying um, a Ferrari or even a Rolex or whatever. Uh, and I think they have this capacity. If you think you need it, it's at a price where you can probably see your way to getting there. Um, I don't see my way to getting there because I don't think I need it. But I can. None of that looks to me like it's priced as a kind of. How's anyone ever afford this that kind of thing? So that was my, um, yeah, that's my kind of thought on the people that need it. I think the people that think they need it will find ways to buy it, which is great for a company like LVMH. Yeah, I think this, um, they, they, they're quite, they've got quite a broad spectrum of brands. Uh, I think they have got a, and I'm for the people who are only listening, like an aspirational ladder of people who want to climb the ladder of brands from the not so massively expensive to the 
you know, you're wasting your money on a five hundred or million pound watch, which I think he he spoke about in one of the, uh, and it is an awful watch. Um, in the uh, it's gaudy as all hell. I'll put a picture up for anybody at home. But yeah, there is an aspirational ladder there that you can you can climb. Um, you know, up the brands, and they'll sort of save you the the whole way up. So. Um, yeah, fascinating company, Steve. I think this one I'll just be happy to sit on for a while. Now, I, I, I'm unsure what to do. Uh, I have to rework out uh, all of my figures because they're already 18% out from uh, where I thought they would be. Um, the only other thing I would highlight is it's still actually 18% off its all-time highs. I know that's a useless statistic to anybody, but this is not something that has all of a sudden returned to all-time highs. So um, there may be something there. And a couple of blots on an otherwise pretty decent record. Um, LVMH has a stake in both Peloton and Free Trade. So, um, yeah, a blot in another otherwise perfect um, record, I would say. Keep that quiet, don't they? Um, that they're um, yeah, they also own Peloton and Free Trade as well as uh, LV and M and H uh, built into all that stuff. 